I'm Brooks Brothers Service. I'm 90 years old. I lost my mom when I was three years old. My dad when I was 12. My brothers and sisters raised me. They were pretty nice to me. I have a good family. I have three boys. I have three grandsons, three granddaughters, four great granddaughters, one great grandson, and I'm proud of you, each and every one. I mean, love them all the same. I love each and every one the same, especially Christian. Everybody was, was uh, at that time, everybody was, uh, wanted to get in the service. And I, I wanted to go and they wouldn't let me because I wasn't old enough. So uh, I told my brother, will you? And he said, you really want to go? And I said, yeah, I want to go. So I signed up and he had to sign for me. And I went in. So. The date. The date. When, it was four days before Pearl Harbor. That's when you had signed up. When, no, when I went. That's when I went in. I signed in before that. You know, I don't know when it was, but uh, that's when I went in. And, and uh, I thought I was going to go fight the uh, Japanese, and I wound up in Africa. So you don't know what they're going to do with you when you go in. I went to four, place, four days before Pearl Harbor. I spent about a week or so there. And from there we went to uh, Lompoc, California, Camp Roberts. I spent about three months there, I guess. And then from there we went to Santa Barbara, Camp Cook. From there, we went to Indio, California, Camp Young, the desert. And we trained in that desert. Oh, we go from Indio, plumb down the, the Death Valley, right way down below, plumb close to Nevada and back. Then in November of 43, we left and went to, uh, we landed in Casablanca, Africa. That was my first invasion. It was a cakewalk because uh, we were fighting the French and we actually, it was our Navy against them and they got rid of them in a hurry. And we just walked into Casablanca, spending, I don't know, a little time there, and then from there they, we left and went to uh, Fad Ramo, up at El Guitar, or in Gafsa, G-A-F-S-A, -S and he knocked the tart of us, he whipped us, and we straight went into the Tesserine Pass. And we were waiting for him to come after the me. If he would have, I don't think I'd be talking to you guys today, but he went the other direction. And the British uh, tackled him and the, the British 8th Army. And then old Patton came over and he took over. Cause I went over with the 1st Armor Division and old Rommel destroyed it, more or less. What was left of us, they threw us with a old pattern. Of course, my I was in a battalion there, what they call a bastard battalion. Just they'd put you anywhere they want to. And uh, with a division, we were just a little battalion, and they put you anywhere. So we, well, they threw us in with Patton, and he he went over to Federal Rama and whipped him, I guess. 
and after that, we crossed into Sicily when they invaded Sicily, you know. Old Patton was anxious to get to, to beat Montgomery to Messina, and he did. And there was a cakewalk in Sicily, wasn't much of a. For some of them, the landing forces, you know, it was a little rough, but otherwise, we went through it like we went plumb up to Messina. Then we went into Italy just a little inland, and then they pull us out, and we volunteered for the. Some of us volunteered for the 101st Airborne. So they took us out and we spent a little time out there. Then they sent us to England. We came around the Rock Hill, Gibraltar, and then up to England. And then we trained there for, for D-Day with the 101st. So on the D-Day, We just, Utah wasn't as bad as Omaha. And we went in, we were inland quite a bit, quite a ways, you know. And, and the 4th Infantry came in by water, and we joined them later. And then we spent from June the 6th till July the 25th, right there at the uh, the landing, Normandy, and then we broke through the uh, to Saint Lo. That morning, that uh, my birthday, July twenty fifth, they started a artillery barrage in back of us, and where the shells were hidden, it looked like the sun was coming up. Where they were exploding, you know. And it was early in the morning. And then after they got through, here come the big old bombers, the full motor bombers. There was thousands, I guess a thousand or more of them. When they got through, the two motor bombers came over. And they hit that again. And then after they got through, the dive bombers. When they got through, well, they turned us loose so we could go in and there were still some Germans coming out of there, all dazed. And they had to use the bulldozers to make a road so we could get in there from the craters. They were so deep, some of them, you could put a tank in there. And we finally broke through there and we went plumb to where they call the filet pocket, I think they were. We had a bunch of Germans surrounded up there. In the and we fought there for, I don't know, quite a while. And then they, quite a few of them escaped there, so we lost. We got a lot of them, but this, a lot of them escaped. And from there on, it wasn't too bad that we got to the Siegfried Line. They used to call them dragon teeth, you know, cement blocks that you couldn't go across with a tank. You have to turn them down, but, and we fought there to uh, in for quite a while. They, they killed a lot of doughboys there. And then we finally broke through, and close to the winter, a German gathered in that hurricane forest and they put a force there that uh, big enough that they broke through, and we had to stop him again. And that's when we got caught at the uh, at the bulge, you know, Bastogne. That's where we were surrounded again. Tenth uh, armored battalion, I think it was, or a regiment. And there was some infantry, but I forget which one it was. Anyway, we were surrounded for 
for uh, the 17th of December till the day after Christmas. <coughs> and uh, they told us to save a round for ourselves, you know, in case uh, they capture us that they were going to kill us anyway. And I said, hell no, I'll take another crumb before I kill my myself. And the day after Christmas, we heard a ruckus over in the perimeter, you know. And we said, oh, oh the Germans are coming. They've got us. They've got us. And they was old Patton. They traveled over a hundred miles to to get us out of that uh, where we were surrounded. The snow was waist deep and cold. We used to go to no bar nowhere to drink coffee and get a sandwich or something, you know. And they they use that thing for a hospital. And there was a bunch of poor kids out there. A leg cut off or an arm. So, well, after Patton got there, we they got a out of there, and from there on, it went a straight walk to plumb up to the Elbe River, close to Berlin. We were supposed to meet the Russians there, and we waited and waited about two weeks. Finally, they got there, and uh, they were supposed to be our friends, and they had given us some new tanks, M10s, you know, with a 90 millimeter, and the Russians started shooting at us. Colonel Bailey said, the hell it is, well, we blew a few of their tanks, you know, you never seen so many white flags. They knew we were there, but they, they were just trying us out. After that, they were friendly. They were, they were giving us vodka and everything else. <laughs> I came home, and I was a free, free soldier again. And that's about it. But uh, all battles are about the same. Sometimes you're scared, and other times you're not. But, but I guess. God's so great that he got us back, some of us. He's been good to me all the way. And I thank him every minute I get. I was out with a messenger on a motorcycle. And that didn't last too long because I burned my, my knees, you know. I said, no, I don't want to be a messenger. I gave the motorcycle up. And then we st I started driving the mail uh, jeep, you know. And after that, they threw us with a, a tank, M10, you know. And from then on, I went, went to, uh, tank to Africa. Yeah, we were a weed button, and they called us back so we could uh, support the 101st again because uh, they had sent us back to the our tank outfit and we were supposed to support the 101st anywhere they went so we were plumb up at Wiesbaden and they called us back and we got caught right there at Bastogne you know and we were cut off and we, we were surrounded and they were they shell us First, they bomb us quite a bit. You know, the, the weather was a little clear, and but it snowed already. The snow was deep, and then it snowed some more, and then it just cleared a little bit, you know. And here comes the planes, and they bomb us, and then it get cloudy again. Our planes got in one time and brought us some supplies. We were out of ammunition and everything else, and they broke through. And they, I mean, a nice day. But, and they went in there and dropped. But some of the stuff fell on the on the German side, so we lost a lot of it, you know. 
પણ સ્ટીલ ગેસ કામ આવે છે સપ્લાય યુ નો લાઈક એમ્યુનેશન ઇન સમ ડી ઇન દેન વી જસ્ટ આવર લાસ્ટ સિટ ઓફ ધ લાસ્ટ ડે વે વેન પેટ કેમ ઇન વી ડેન્ટ હેવ મચ એમ્યુનેશન ઓર એનીથિંગ એલ્સ લેફ્ટ યુ નો અ વેરી લિટલ સો વી વર લકી ધેટ પેટ કેમ ઇન દેન તો ધે ઓલરેડી had more or less had us. Uh, one of the generals came in there and he asked for us to surrender. And that's when our general told him, nuts to you. And uh, they asked the big general, German general, what did they tell you? And he said, at that general, and they said, nerds to you. <laughs> But that old General McAuliffe told him, nuts to you. There at Bastogne, we were guarding the underpass under the railroad. There was a little road there underneath that railroad. And uh, you couldn't see nothing on the fog. And somebody heard something and he started shooting. We had two tanks there guarding. And he started shooting the next morning when it cleared up. We went up there and there was about 30 or so uh, dead Germans out there. But they were trying to cross there and they think somebody heard him in the tanks and they they had machine guns you know and they, they were about 30 35 or something like that you know like them germans right there at the hedgerows in the, in normandy they were thick hedgerows they were one side way on the other one you could hear them talk They used to holler at us, uh, these comes here, Americani. Come here, Americans. We'd tell them, go to hell, you crowd. We'd borrow them uh, uh, mortars from the Doughboys, 81 millimeters, and we'd shoot over the hedge open. We could hear some screaming out there from the Germans, you know. But that getting pretty close to the front line. when you can hear him talking. I can tell you one that I'm not too proud of, but uh, I left my gun and my helmet on top of the tank. And we used to stretch a wire from one tank to the other for our telephone. And it was dark and sizzly in the mountain. You couldn't see your pan in front of you. And I felt something, you know, when I was stretching the wire. And I didn't have nothing to defend myself but my trench knife. And I pulled it up and stabbed that guy all to pieces. A hundred times, I guess. And the next moment we went up to look at him, he had a bullet right between some doughboy had killed him, you know. And here I stabbed that German all to pieces. He was dead already. They used to call me the crowd killer. I don't, I didn't care because he scared the tar out of me. I thought he was a live German. But I stabbed him till he was already dead. He wasn't going to hurt me. <laughs> But they used to kid me about that. I didn't care. It was just a pass over there where he But the only way you could cross that mountain out there, you know, there was two of them, Fate Pass and Kasserine Pass. We hid on, on that uh, Kasserine Pass, and we'd come out every once in a while to see what was going on, and, and nothing happened, so that, that was about it. After that, we went to Basurdi, <coughs> Basurdi there in Tunisia, And the thing went about over over there. So that's when Romwell gave up. I think they called him back to Germany and somebody else took over. But, but uh, he was already whipped. And not whipped because a lot of them troops went to Sicily and you know, we had to fight them over there, so. No. 
Sicily wasn't too bad. And it's the place I like, one of the, one of the places I like the most over there. No? I was glad to get back. No, Rod, just, just another civilian, I guess. And I looked around and found Stella and married her. So that was about it. Oh, yeah, for not. I made a promise, you know, if I get back, I'd uh, I make a pilgrimage or whatever you call it to Chimayo. When I came back, my brother in law and I. Minutes. We walked from here to see my old. You, we, we hit one of them Jew uh, concentration camps, and we hit them gates with our tanks, you know, and broke in there. And them poor Jews were in big old barns there, just a bag of bones, just moaning, you know, and and the, behind there, that. The camp there, there was some boxcars full of dead uh, bodies, you know, by bones, and and I smelled it. Uh, I smelled it for two weeks. I couldn't hardly eat. I smell stayed with you, but we we try to help them poor guys, you know. We'd give them some of our K rations and stuff. I think we killed more of them than <laughs> they were killed by the Germans, but they. Finally, a colonel told us, don't, don't feed him, don't feed him. We didn't know it. They have to start him out with a little super stuff, you know, but we were trying to help him, you know, give him something to eat. 